Hello, everyone, again. Um, the, the, talk of, uh, the, the title of this talk is uh, Properties of L2 Lexicon uh, in Refugee Children, Evidence from a War Association Task in Greek. And uh, this, this project uh, is, uh, is conducted within the Multimind project, as, uh, as it was mentioned before. So uh, this is the outline of the presentation. Uh, we will start with the theoretical background and what we uh, are also basing our study on. We will talk about um, the, the following topics, so lexical competence, the what association, what association tasks are, and uh, the type of uh, the types of association that we can uh, evaluate. We will look at some uh, previous findings on L2 children, which is the, the target population also in our study. And we will also uh, talk about some uh, specific war association patterns that uh, can, can provide indications for uh, uh, word knowledge. Then we will move to the current study um, and uh, I will provide all the information about it. And then we will, uh, we will uh, end, this, end this talk with a discussion um, where we will combine the theoretical background and um, uh, what we found in our study. So um, starting with the dimensions of lexical competence, we have um, three, according to the literature, we have size, depth, and organization. Size indicates uh, actually how many words a speaker knows. It can be 10, it can be 10,000. Depth uh, refers to the degree to which each word is known, um, well-known or not so well-known, for example. Whereas organization has to do with the connections, with the links between a word, with, between different words in the lexicon. Um, so for example, if we see or if we hear the word dog, uh, which words would come to our mind and what type of connections with these words um, there will be. Um, the, the, the main uh, dimension that we will be dealing with here is organization and word association tasks can be used to assess this dimension. Although these acts uh, can, also, uh, can also explore the other two dimensions, uh, meaning depth and size. Um, in this task, participants are presented uh, either orally or in a written mode with um, words, uh, stimuli. And uh, after that, they need to provide uh, one or more words as responses. And one way to evaluate this data is to look at what type of connection, what type of association do we have between a stimulus and a given word? And elaborating a bit more on the last point here, um, there have been different uh, terms in terms of the, the, cate the categories of uh, associations in the literature. So um, a, a more like in, in the past, a more traditional way to, uh, to categorize responses uh, was a distinction between paradigmatic associations and syntagmatic associations. Paradigmatic associations um, refer to cases where, uh, in a more traditional approach, a response uh, has the same word class with a given stimulus. Let's say if, if a stimulus is uh, the word bag, and a participant says sack, then this response would be classified as a paradigmatic association. In contrast, if uh, we have the same stimulus, uh, bag, but the participant says carry, uh, here we have two different word classes um, in terms of the more traditional um, approach. And uh, this response would be classified as syntagmatic association. Later on, another uh, category was uh, included, the, the clan category. And in this case, uh, we would include um, responses which uh, are similar on a phonological web level with a stimulus. So here we would have, for example, the, the stimulus bag, the same one, and then the response could be bag. Um, then in, the, in more recent studies, um, someone can find different terminology as well, different terms, which um, are considered more transparent in terms of what they represent. 
So sometimes could be semantic or locational and phonological. And also the criteria have changed um, quite a lot. It can vary. Uh, so they don't necessarily um, rely only on the word class of the stimulus and the response, but also another criteria, as we will see also in following studies that we will discuss. And there is uh, finally um, another set of uh, terms, uh, the following one, which is also the target one, uh, the one that we, uh, we are following in uh, our study. Um, so here we have meaning-based, position-based, and form-based associations, which um, correspond to a great extent, at least, to the previous terms. So um, regarding the target categorization paradigm that, um, as mentioned, we are also following in our study, uh, it's, uh, pro it's proposed by Fitzpatrick in the study uh, in 2006. And this uh, paradigm is based on the word knowledge model by nation. Um, in this model, um, um, we, we have the, some, some main aspects of word knowledge. So what do we know about word? And the three main aspects uh, about word knowledge are meaning. Uh, we know the meaning of a word, uh, the use of this word, how this word is used, and then we also know information about the form of this word. Based on these aspects of word knowledge, um, then the, the given broad categories were created, uh, meaning-based, position-based, and form-based, and then a fourth category is also included, erratic associations, which are uh, these broad categories, but each one of these broad categories uh, includes several subcategories. So we, we end up with a quite exhaustive and accurate categorization of uh, the responses that are provided by speakers. And uh, in this study, um, the researcher worked with adults L2 and L1 uh, speakers. And uh, based on the results, it was found that um, it's a quite efficient uh, tool to compare uh, L2 and L1 speakers because there might be some differences found when we look at the broad categories. But when we look at the subcategories, uh, we can see some subtle differences between the two groups that otherwise would not be um, uncovered. So this is the paradigm that they, um, they, uh, the, the, it was employed in the study by Fitzpatrick in 2006. I'm not going to go through all of them now because we will talk about it also, um, take it to our study later. But I just wanted you to see here uh, the four main broad categories and then all the sub but there are many subcategories in each one of the broad categories. So it's a quite uh, exhaustive paradigm. Now we will look at some findings, um, previous findings uh, about the target group that we uh, also worked with, uh, L2 children. And first we, we will be discussing a study uh, that was conducted in 2004. And in this study, uh, there were three groups of speakers, a bilingual group, a person Swedish, a person control group and a Swedish control group. Here they actually did not only work with children, but there was a wide age range from preschoolers to even adults. Um, and uh, in this task, the, the participants had to provide only one response to each stimulus. Uh, the bilingual group was tested in both languages, so both Persian and Swedish. And the core categorization of the responses involved paradigmatic, syntagmatic, and clang. So here we have the more traditional, let's say, terms of um, of uh, categories. And then um, what's important here is that um, the criteria to uh, classify responses as paradigmatic or syntagmatic associations were not, was not really only the word class, uh, as uh, mentioned before. But as you can see here, um, um, a response would be, would, would be classified as a paradigmatic association when um, the link between, between the response and the stimulus uh, was um, 
mainly semantic. So when the two, when the two uh, words have a clear semantic relationship, uh, regardless of the word class. And uh, syntagmatic associations, then we have uh, words, again, regardless of the word class, which can occur in a, in, a, in a structure that is well formed. So what was found in this study? Uh, about the clank uh, associations, uh, they found that when we look at within groups, um, younger speakers tend to produce more clank associations compared to older ones. But when we look at uh, comparisons between groups, we see that the bilingual uh, group um, provide more clang associations compared to the two control groups. And this applied to, this applied to both uh, languages, Persian and Swedish. When we look at uh, syntagmatic associations, um, within group comparisons showed that um, there was not a systematic pattern, but there was a trend showing that um, the, the, the provision of syntagmatic associations was um, more limited um, around the ages of primary school. And um, again, there was no clear pattern um, when it comes to between group comparisons, where in one language, when we compared one language, bilingual and monolingual group, uh, the bilingual group would, would, would provide more syntagmatic associations. When, but when we look at the other language, the monolingual group will provide more stigmatic associations. So it was not really, as it seems, um, it didn't really depend on whether the a speaker was bilingual or monolingual, but probably had to do something with a, with a target language. Regarding paradigmatic associations within groups showed that, again, there was not um, a consistent pattern. But uh, what's important was that there was a great decrease from preschool to primary school. So preschoolers did not provide a lot of paradigmatic associations, but then there was a quite um, steep increase um, in primary school education um, uh, children. However, what's also important here is that this category was the most frequent one for all grades. So uh, preschoolers, primary school education, adults provided uh, more paradigmatic associations compared to syntagmatic and clank. Um, and lastly, between group comparisons showed that um, the control groups, the monolinguals provided more paradigmatic associations compared to the bilingual group. And again, this was the case for both languages. So we see a reverse pattern if we compare it to the clank, clank associations. Moving to the next study, uh, conduct in 2006. Here they worked with uh, two groups, uh, one bilingual group and one monolingual group. And the age range here was more narrow. Uh, it ranged between five to eight. And the L2 proficiency of the bilingual group was um, quite high. Here you see a difference uh, compared to the previous study. Um, the, the participants here had to provide three responses uh, and not one to each stimulus. And the, the bilingual group, again, was tested in both languages. Um, the categorization of the responses here involved only two categories, paradigmatic and syntagmatic. So there were, there were no clank, for example, um, phonologically based uh, related responses, associations. So uh, what were the results? Uh, if we look at only the bilingual group, uh, that was tested, as, uh, as I said, in both languages, um, the researchers found a comparable performance in the two languages. So there was not really a difference uh, in the performance of the bilingual group, uh, depending on the language. Um, a similar pattern was observed when they looked at the two groups. So um, again, the performance was quite comparable. And what was specifically found was that uh, that was applicable to both uh, groups was that um, when they provided the first response, they provide a high proportion of paradigmatic associations, but, but moving to the third response, they provided less, considerably less paradigmatic associations. So there was a decrease across the trials. And something else that was found and was applicable to, uh, to both groups uh, was that um, 
again, there was um, the, the two categories of syndagmatic and paradigmatic associations were actually quite, uh, quite common, not only paradigmatic, but also syndagmatic. So uh, both categories seem to play an important role um, in terms of how the mental lexicon is organized in both L2, but also L1 speakers, and in this case, children. The last study that uh, we will uh, talk about today is uh, a more recent one conducted in 2020. Uh, but here we also had two, uh, two groups, a bilingual and a monolingual group uh, with uh, English um, as uh, the first language of the bilingual group and Hebrew, the second language. The age range uh, is between six and nine years. And here again, the participants had to provide only one response to each stimulus. Um, in contrast to the previous studies here, the, um, the bilingual group was only tested in the L2, so in Hebrew. And here we see um, a, parad a paradigm of categorization that includes more categories. So we have paradigmatic, syntagmatic, phonological, morphologically infected, inflected uh, responses. We have errors and they also coded no responses. And also here you can see a mix of terminology, uh, more traditional one uh, in a sense, a more, uh, more recent one. So uh, what did they found? Um, they found that uh, when comparing the two groups uh, in the different categories of, um, of uh, association, uh, they found a similar performance. So there was no, actually no difference between the groups uh, in all categories. And um, what was also similar in the two, in, in both groups was that um, when the, the proportion of paradigmatic associations uh, increased, then the proportion of syntagmatic association uh, decreased. Um, some findings, uh, however, only applicable to the, um, uh, the, um, to the uh, bilingual group was that uh, the proportion of morphologically infect inflected responses was negatively associated with a score that um, this, the, the children, um, another, another, uh, the score in another task that the children completed. And that was a naming task. So when they had a high score in the naming task, then they provided a smaller proportion of morphologically inflected uh, responses. And uh, lastly, the morphologically inflected response, however, was quite rare um, uh, in both groups. So uh, all, these, uh, all these studies provide us with uh, important and very useful indications regarding the word association patterns in L2 and L1 children. However, um, uh, it is important to highlight that um, previously we, um, we presented the study by Fitzpatrick in the paradigm uh, that the, the, the she proposed in 2006. And uh, it, as it was mentioned, um, some, some more subtle differences between L1 and L2 speakers could be uh, uncovered. So this uh, these detailed paradigm seems to be um, uh, very effective. Um, there are some studies that we talked before that seem to provide some indications for subtle differences. Uh, for example, that synonyms may be more frequent um, in, in monolingual uh, speakers, in L1 speakers compared to uh, L2 speakers. But in none of the studies, the, there was no um, systematic mapping of subcategories um, in terms of all the broad uh, association categories. And uh, another thing that we, we deem is important to take into account here is that um, in, in our study, we work with refugee children. And uh, as expected, their proficiency level uh, would not be um, very advanced. Um, so it, we deemed very important to, to look at um, different subcategories and try to, to, uh, to assess the word association patterns in um, as much detail as possible. Uh, before moving to our study, uh, we will look at some um, information uh, from uh, based on the literature 
um, according to which um, some association patterns can can uh, denote um, specific to, to what extent some words are known actually. So we can see based on some studies how the two dimensions of uh, two dimensions of the lexical competence, depth and organization can be interrelated. Um, these two frameworks that we will be discussing, um, look at the lexicon, not as a whole, but actually look at each word separately. Um, and um, in, 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 the, in the past, there was a, um, a quite prominent an idea uh, of, uh, as, uh, as mentioned here, the notion of syntagmatic and paradigmatic shift. According to this um, idea, uh, when we work with L1 speakers, we would expect that when the age uh, increases, uh, the, the paradigmatic associations would actually outnumber the syntagmatic associations. Uh, under the assumption that paradigmatic associations are more mature in a sense. So we would see this shift in the, in the word association patterns after a specific age. And uh, um, similarly to this, when, we, when uh, we work with L2 speakers, we would expect uh, this shift to, to, be, to be seen but when the proficiency level increases. So we would, we would again see a L1-like performance. However, the lexicon is dynamic and this is what is taken into account in the frameworks that we will be discussing. So uh, not only L2 speakers, but L1 learners as well, keep learning words. And uh, at different, different points, different words are known to different degrees. So um, we may know some words very well, we may know some other words not so well. We might even forget words across the years and we need to learn them again. So um, this way take is taken into account and um, they, these, these models are proposed. The first one is the depth of individual word knowledge model uh, proposed by Volta in 2001. And as you can see here, we have different circles. Uh, the more central ones, involving uh, words that are quite well known are expected to yield more paradigmatic associations. So higher lexical knowledge uh, would lead to more paradigmatic associations. Moving further from the central um, circles, uh, we move to the words that are moderately well known and um, it's expected that these words will uh, mostly yield syntagmatic associations. And then moving, moving even further from uh, the central um, circles, we have words that are slightly known. And these words are expected to, um, uh, to generate more phonological associations. So based on how well we know a word, we would expect different types of associations. In this study, they, uh, they also conducted uh, um, an experiment. And here we will see uh, what were the findings. So uh, words that were completely unknown or slightly known, um, quite often, uh, providing uh, yield to no, no responses. So no responses were often given for words that were completely unknown or slightly known. Uh, and this was applicable to both L1 and L2 speakers. But uh, more, what was the most frequent uh, phenomenon here was that uh, phonological or unclassified responses were provided. Um, here I need to clarify that um, the, the research in this study, uh, they besides the word association task, they also conducted another task um, during which the, the participants would need to self-report how familiar are with these words. So the information from uh, both tasks were kind of combined to uh, also um, come to some conclusions. Moving on to the words that were moderately known uh, for the L2 speakers, um, it was found that they provided quite many syntagmatic associations, but also uh, there was a high proportion of phonological responses. 
Uh, regarding the L2 the L1 speakers, uh, again, we had a high number of syntagmatic associations, but we didn't have such a high number of phonological responses. There were uh, phonological responses, but um, considerably less frequently. And finally, regarding the well-known words, uh, phonological and unclassified responses are almost non-existent for both groups. And they seem to be replaced by uh, syntagmatic and paradigmatic associations. So both categories seem to be uh, to play an important role uh, for L2 and L1 speakers. But if we compare the two groups, um, it was found that L2 speakers provided more syntagmatic associations compared to paradigmatic, and the reverse pattern uh, holds for uh, holds for them. L1 speakers. So um, both categories um, yeah, seem to play an important role, but the, the, um, the L2 lexicon, it seems that probably is uh, mostly organized on a stagmatic level. But uh, as it is highlighted also in the study, it doesn't mean that um, some aspects in the L2 lexicon or some aspects in the L1 lexicon are inferior or superior compared to uh, the other one. So it's just like that we have some similarities and it seems to be that there are also some differences uh, between uh, the speakers. Um, the, the second framework that we will uh, see here is the one suggested by NAMI in 2004. And uh, as you can see on the right side of the, of the, of the slide, you can see here the continuum. So words that are from unknown to well-known. Unknown words um, are expected to uh, not uh, produce, do not lead to any responses. Bar uh, barely familiar words um, to lead to form-based um, responses. Moderately known words to syntagmatic, fairly well-known words to paradigmatic, and well-known words can lead to both paradigmatic and syntagmatic. Uh, so um, we see some differences um, from um, the model, uh, the predictions of the model, uh, the previous one. But uh, in both cases, we see the, the important role of, uh, of both categories um, when we deal with well-known words. And again, um, just to point out that here again, you see a kind of a combination of um, terminology. So um, here, the, they also conducted a task, uh, an experiment with L1 and L2 speakers. It's also the study that we discussed earlier. And based on these findings, they, um, they suggested the, 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 the given um, framework. So um, in, the, in the study, they saw that syntag syntagmatic and phonological associations were present even in L1 speakers and quite advanced L2 speakers. And in contrast, um, paradigmatic associations were, um, were also provided by L2 speakers that we had a lower proficiency level. So it does be present in um, both L1 and L2 speakers. So this is why um, what I suggest is to look at different words uh, separately and not um, the mental lexicon as a whole. So this was the theoretical background. Um, and now we are moving to the study that we have uh, conducted. And uh, this is questions that we, um, we raise are the following ones. So firstly, what are the word association patterns in L2 Greek children with a refugee background? And what are the factors that affect these patterns? And secondly, what are the similarities with and the differences from the word association patterns in L1 Greek children? So we try to, um, to uh, answer these questions. And um, to do so, we worked with uh, 102 primary school pupils, all enrolled in formal Greek education. And um, we had an experimental group uh, that was composed of L2 pupils with a refugee background. Uh, all attending reception classes in Greece. 
And then a control group uh, composed of L1, uh, L1 pupils attending mainstream classes, I guess, again, in Greece. In Greece. Here you see the main characteristics of the two, of the two groups. Uh, the sample is the same in the two groups. Um, also, the mean age is almost identical, um, around uh, 10 years of age on average. And then we try to have, um, as much as possible, an uh, equal number of pupils across the target grades. We worked with uh, students from the second until the sixth grade. Uh, we only didn't work with uh, first graders. Um, the, the L2 children um, were enrolled in the school for um, around uh, eight, eight months on average. So they, they, they were not attending uh, schooling for uh, quite a long period of time. And here you can see the L1s um, of the groups. Of course, for the L1 group is Greek. And for the L2 group, the, the most common L1 was Kurdish. The second most common one was uh, Farsi, then Arabic, and a few, only a few uh, children had two L1s. And the two L1s were two of the aforementioned ones. So either Kurdish or Farsi or Kurdish or, and Arabic. And lastly, we wanted also to look at the um, L2 proficiency level of uh, the L2 group. And what was found was that it was uh, rather low. Uh, most of them had a, um, had a uh, had a proficiency level that, that would be classified as A0, and uh, the rest of them uh, had an A1 uh, proficiency level. And both groups uh, also completed a background questionnaire. So looking at the material, um, we, we tested 48 words in total, 24 nouns and 24 verbs. The aim here was to compare the performance of uh, the children in uh, in the two um, word classes, whether it would play a role. But we will not be discussing these results um, today, mainly because of um, time. And uh, all, the, all the words would be fall into the, do the thematic domain of environment and nature. But we try to select words that would be, would accord with the um, expected L2 level of, uh, the L of the bilingual group, of the L2 group and also to, to deal with words that would appear quite frequently across textbooks. In terms of the procedure, uh, it was um, administered orally. Uh, the children could provide uh, one or more, more responses to each stimulus, so there was no uh, limit actually. And uh, we allowed the L2 group to respond not only in in the Greek language, but also in their L1 or in L3, for example, English. And uh, we thought that maybe they know a word um, in terms of uh, um, comprehension, but they, they're not able to produce the word that they would like to produce. So we, we decided to give them the opportunity to, um, to respond in different uh, languages. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, the main uh, paradigm that uh, we, um, we based our study on was the one suggested by Fitzpatrick in 2006, but we adjusted it based on other studies and also based on the responses that we, um, that we saw in our study. So we came up with uh, these main categories, meaning-based associations, position-based associations, dual-leak associations, form-based erratic associations. And then we also had three type of responses that don't really uh, denote the type of association, but we decide to not uh, remove them and code them. So to see when, um, when um, children would give a translation, a nonverbal response, because it was um, nonverbal responses were also present in, uh, in L2 uh, children or um, erratic nonverbal responses. And each one of the association categories uh, included several subcategories. So now we will uh, look closer at all categories that we, um, that we included. Uh, first, we look at the broad category of meaning-based associations. The first subcategory was synonym. X is always the stimulus that was presented to, 
to the children? And why is the response that was given? And in these pairs, the first one always uh, is X and the second one always is Y. So uh, for example, for synonym, um, you can see here examples from uh, the L2 group and the L1 group. For example, here we have uh, the stimulus uh, rubbish and uh, a child would say trash. Um, we also had uh, cases of antonyms. So uh, the response is an antonym to the stimulus. For example, the stimulus go up and a child would say go down. Cases of hierarchical or lexical set, uh, the two words um, are in the same lexical set and have a relationship of coordination or uh, superordination. So um, for example, the stimulus would be uh, animal and um, the response would be dog. Here, um, yeah, of course you can see the Greek, uh, the responses and the, and the stimuli in Greek, but also in English. Then we had cases of conceptual association um, where the, the stimulus and the response have some conceptual link uh, on a broader level. Uh, for example, the stimulus could be sun and uh, the response could be hat. Quality, in these cases, the response is a quality to the stimulus or the stimulus is a quality to the response. So for example, we would have uh, rain and water uh, or uh, flower and color. Then we have definition. Uh, y is a phrase sufficiently denoting the meaning of X. For example, we can have ice as a stimulus and the answer would be frozen water. So we would have a phrase that uh, efficiently um, uh, defines the, the, the stimulus. And then lastly, we would have a case of context. So here, the response would actually be a context that denotes the meaning of X. We can see here response by an L2 child, the stimulus was rain. And uh, the literal translation of what it was said was it must umbrella when you go out. So they, they, they kind of give a context where we understand the meaning of the, of the stimulus word. Moving on to the position-based associations, we have three subcategories, consecutive collocation, where the Y, the response follows or precedes X directly or with only an article between them. For example, we have the stimulus clean and the response house. So a phrase would be, I clean the house. We only have an article between the two words. In contrast, phrasal collocation denotes, um, refers to the following cases. Y follows or precede, precedes X in a phrase, but with a word other than an article or words between them. So it can be a word, but not an article. So here, for example, we can have live and house, but we would say I live in the house. So we also have a proposition um, apart from the article. And then what we notice in our data was that some cases, uh, two collocations were provided. So we would have two Y uh, components that follow precede the X and form both a consecutive and a phrasal collocation. So for the stimulus clean, a response would be, uh, I clean the house, consecutive collocation with mom, phrasal collocation. Then we move to the dual link associations. Here, we have a combination of two subcategories. And the two subcategories belong to different broad categories. Uh, and some examples here, um, for example, um, we have lexical set, which belongs to the meaning-based association, broad, broad category, and consecutive collocation that belongs to the broad category of position-based associations. So yeah, we have a combination of subcategories. And we have looked at the characteristics of the different subcategories. You can see here a hierarchical lexical set uh, being combined with a different, um, with the three different position-based subcategories. The same for conceptual, quality, again, three subcategories uh, with quality and the three um, position-based uh, subcategories. And then the last one, that is uh, a bit different is the subcategory of compound. 
um, where y is a compound word with x as one of its components. No such responses were provided by the L2 group, but we have some from the L1 group. So the stimulus would be go up, aneveno in Greek, and then the child would say anevokateveno, which is actually go up and down. Then we have form-based associations. Um, so we have um, um, a derivation here. Uh, for example, uh, zo, uh, live is the, the stimulus word, and then the response would be life, zoe in Greek. We have case of reflection, um, for example, um, cloud, clouds, or I cut, you cut. We have cases of similar form only. So Y looks or sounds similar to X, but has no clear meaning link. For example, here, uh, the stimulus word was pagos, which means ice. And the response that was provided by an L2 child was magos, which means wizard. So they look and sound similarly, but there was no uh, really a, a link on a meaning level. We have a case of similar form association where Y is an associate of a word with a similar form to X. Here, the stimulus word is height, uh, which is krivo in Greek. But krivo sounds like krio, and krio means cold. So here, a word, a response that was, that was provided by an L2 child was zesty, and zesty means heat. So heat could actually, uh, actually can be an associate to uh, cold, which sounds like um, height, the Greek uh, version of height in, um, yeah, krivo. And then um, we have another um, in the similar direction, a subcategory of similar X form, uh, similar Y form, uh, where Y looks or sounds similar to a possible response word. So here the, the stimulus is hyoni, snow in English, and the response is anthropos, which means man. But this was given instead of um, another possible uh, that could be possibly uh, provided which was uh, the response hyonanthropos, um, which is snowman. And this would actually be uh, an associate of the stimulus word. Uh, we have the radical associations then. Um, the first one, the first subcategory is uh, no link, where there's no actually a link between uh, the two words, uh, lightning and pear, or beach and um, name. We have repetitions, where actually just the, stimul the stimulus word is repeated, cover, cover. Uh, we have erratic compounds in this case, um, and what we define as erratic compounds in our study is um, Y, which is a neologism in all cases. Um, so they're compound words with or without X as one of its components. Again, no such response were provided by the L2 group, but we have examples from the L1 group. Uh, an example here is uh, the stimulus rain generated a response like potamolimni, which is a compound word and means river lake. Uh, we also have erratic context, which is actually a context that um, wrongly denotes the meaning of X. For example, uh, the stimulus is animal, and then there is a phrase like kanokat, I do something, but doesn't, there is no actually a link. And then we also have cases of X other language influence. Uh, the response is actually influenced by another language, uh, a different language from the L2. Uh, here we have a st the stimulus kolibo, which means swim. And then the, the response is kulbe. This is a, the a response in Farsi, which means cottage, but actually um, uh, sounds like the, the stimulus word. And lastly, the three additional responses that we coded, translations. Uh, so the stimulus was uh, sun in Greek, and then the, 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 ch the child would respond in English. Uh, 
non-verbal response. So Y is a non-verbal representation of the meaning of X. Uh, the stimulus could be uh, swim, and then they will provide a movement or a gesture. For example, they would do this. Uh, so they would show what the word means. Uh, no such response were provided by the L1 group, and no erratic non-verbal responses either were provided by the L1 group. And here there was again a movement or a gesture, but it was wrong. Um, yes, so these are all the subcategories. Um, this was our uh, whole paradigm that we employed. And moving to the results, uh, we had more than 1,000, uh, 11,000 responses uh, that we coded and analyzed. Um, around 1,700 responses were provided by the L2 group and uh, more than 7,000 uh, responses by the L1 group. So we see that the vast majority of them are provided by the L1 group. And we also looked at how many cases there were where no response were provided. So the children would say, for example, I don't know. And uh, most of them were, um, um, came from the L2 group and only 90, 96 cases of no response uh, were found in, uh, in the L1 group. Here we see um, the proportion of each broad category. So as, uh, as we saw, we had 1,745 responses in total provided by the L2 group. And how many of them proportionally were, um, would be classified in the meaning-based uh, category, position-based, and so on. And the same applies for the, L2, for the L1 group. So for the L2 group, we, we see that the most frequent category was meaning-based. The second most frequent was erratic association category. And then uh, for, the L, uh, for the third category, it was uh, the third more frequent category, it was uh, the position-based association. Um, regarding the L1 group, uh, the order changes. Here, uh, the first one is again, the meaning-based uh, association. Um, the meaning-based association category. Then the second most frequent one is the position-based association category, which here is, a, the, is the third one for the L2 group. And the third one for the L1 group is the dual link association category. So we, we see that um, we see some similarities, but also some differences. Now we will look at um, the different um, subcategories separately within uh, each category. Um, and here we can see that in most subcategories, the, um, the, the performance between the, the two groups was quite similar. Uh, however, uh, when we look at the conceptual association, the, it was most considerably more, uh, more frequent uh, in, in the L1 group compared to the L2 group. In contrast, the con contexts were mostly provided uh, by the L2 group and not so much by the L1 group. Looking at the subcategories within the position-based association category, we see that the performance between the two groups was quite similar. There were no great differences. Uh, regarding the dual link association category, we see again uh, two differences, quite in the same direction as the one we saw uh, in the broad category of meaning based. So here, when we look at the conceptual phrasal collocation, um, these type of responses were significantly more frequent uh, in the L1 group compared to the L2 group, but uh, in, um, differently. Uh, the, the subcategory of quality and consecutive collocation was significantly more common in the L2 group compared to the L1 group. When we move to the form-based associations, um, we see that in most of the cases, um, the, their appearance was significantly more common in the L1, in the L2 uh, group compared to the L1 group. 
but we see the reverse pattern in only one of the subcategories in derivation, where uh, significantly more derivations were uh, generated by the L1 pupils compared to the L2 pupils. In the erratic association category, uh, we see uh, similar performance uh, between the two groups, no great differences. And then uh, here I'm just um, uh, giving the raw frequencies of the additional uh, categories that we coded, translation, nonverbal response, and erratic nonverbal response. And we see that um, of, all of them are actually non-existent or almost non-existent in the L1 uh, group, but uh, they're more frequent in the L2 group. We also ran some regression analysis, uh, and what we found was the, the following. So firstly, uh, the children uh, who, the L2 children, who um, had a higher score in the placement tests, uh, they would provide also more responses in the word association task. Uh, what we also found was that school, school attentions played a significant and important role on many levels. Uh, the children, the L2 children who had um, a longer period of school attendance would use uh, the Greek language uh, during the, the word association task more, more often, but also they would provide more position-based um, responses and also more dual link responses. However, uh, school attendance was negatively associated with the erratic association, so um, the longer the period of school attendance, uh, fewer the erratic associations that were produced. And lastly, another factor that seemed to play a role was that uh, was the involvement in L2 literacy activities. So um, when the children were more, more frequently involved in L2 literacy activities, um, seemed to uh, produce to, get, to provide less nonverbal responses. So in, most, in more cases, they would, they would be able to uh, provide a verbal response. Okay, um, moving on to the discussion. Uh, what we saw firstly was that the L2 children produced significantly few responses compared to the L1 children. Um, what we need to take into account here is that they had rather the L2 group had a rather low L2 proficiency level, as we said, A0 or A1. But what we found was that when they had uh, higher uh, proficiency skills, they would produce more uh, responses. So if they had uh, a more advanced proficiency level, probably they would have more comparable uh, number of responses with the L1 group. Another finding was that um, the most common uh, broad category for both groups was meaning-based associations. But when we compare the, the two groups, we saw that it, this category was more frequent, more common in, uh, in the L1 group compared to the L2 group. We, we saw some similar results in previous studies, for example, in the one in 2004 by NAMI. And um, what we see here is that um, this type of association plays an important role um, in terms of the organization of the mental lexicon in both L1 and um, uh, both uh, and L2 speakers, in this case, children. We also saw that uh, the second most frequent broad association type for the L2 children was erratic associations. However, for the L1 children was mentioned before, we, we need to take into account here here the low proficiency, L2 proficiency level of the L2 group. Um, so we, we can, um, we can see that they um, and assume that they didn't know uh, many words very well as the L1 children did. Also based on the, the frameworks of uh, word knowledge that we saw uh, by NAMI 2004 and Volta 2001. Uh, however, we saw that um, 
when they, the L2 children, when they had a, low, a longer period of school attendance, they would provide uh, more, uh, more position-based associations. So uh, the school attendance seems to, uh, seem to change, to alter positively the, the, the response that were provided by the L2 children. We also saw that the L2 children um, gave some nonverbal responses. So in some cases, they were not able to, um, to, 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 to say some words, to produce some words, but they would be able to show something. The L2, the L1 children did not uh, provide any nonverbal responses. Uh, and the finding that we saw also relate to that was that the, for the L2 children, when they were more frequently involved in activities uh, using the LS, looking at some subcategories, that we, um, we saw that L1 children provide synonyms, but um, uh, this was hardly the case for L2 children. In contrast, the L2 children provided more context. Uh, these results are um, to some extent similar to previous, uh, to, to results from previous studies, uh, studies including adults, but also children. And um, based on this finding, we can say that L1 children uh, provide more tight associations like um, synonyms in this case. But L2 children seem to provide more loose um, links between words that are more broad on a broader scale, uh, like context here. However, we also have some findings in our study that contradict the previous one uh, and that we need to, to further um, think and um, try to explain. So what we also found was that the L1 children provide significantly more conceptual associations, which uh, these type of associations are more loose associations like context. And in the same, di same direction, we found that within the dual link category, the, um, the L1 children provided more response involving a conceptual association, whereas the L2 children provided more responses that involves a quality association. Again, conceptual is a more loose uh, type of association and quality is a more tight. So, um, these, these findings still need uh, more, more thinking. We saw that uh, case of collocation, so cases where we had both a consecutive collocation and a phrasal collocation were rare for both groups, L1 and L2 uh, children, but uh, they were actually almost non-existent for the L2 group. So um, they were just a couple of, uh, of cases. And uh, we can see that L1 children seem to uh, produce more often um, phrases that are more complete. So for example, I hit my head against the wall. So they, they provide a, a more complete phrase, giving a, a, a more complete context. Uh, then we saw um, within the form-based association category that in most cases, um, the the, the L2 uh, group provide more responses of each category, as we saw inflection, uh, similar form, and so on. However, we saw that derivation, uh, responses that uh, with uh, derivation were significantly more frequent uh, by the L1 group. Uh, there were similar studies, were similar results in um, previous study with here that's more, more challenging um, process compared to inflection, for example. It, it needs more time. Um, users need to produce a different, a new word. Um, and derivational knowledge seems to be limited during the first stages of um, L2 acquisition. And uh, this, the children in our, in our study uh, have quite a proficiency. The last finding was that um, uh, there were compounds provided by the L1 group, but no compounds produced by the L2 group. Um, and we, see a sim we can see a similarity uh, with the process of derivation. So 
compounding and derivation in contrast to inflection uh, involve the creation of a new uh, word. So compound as well can be considered quite demanding uh, for the L2 uh, children. And um, in study by Fitzpatrick in 2006, uh, compounds were actually included in the category, in the subcategories of messages let's say from from this uh, talk um, we saw that similar to the previous studies uh, we we find comparable organization aspects of the mental lexicon in l1 and l2 children uh, we found some differences however we need to take into account here that the l2 proficiency level of the children in our study was quite low so um, based on the models that we discussed, uh, we can um, assume that many of the words were not so well known by the L2 children. We saw that uh, school attendance and involvement in literacy activities can positively alter their response patterns in L2 children. And some sub subcategories that we found that they were rather challenging for the L2 children were synonyms, derivations, and compounds. But there, as mentioned before, there are still some findings that need further um, uh, thinking uh, and evaluation. For example, when uh, we saw that L1 children produce significantly more conceptual associations. There's a lot still that could be said. Um, um, there's a lot of data to analyze and uh, um, that we didn't have time to, um, to discuss here, the influence of word class, um, the pupils' performance on the different uh, words based on their characteristics, and also take into account some other background characteristics of the pupils. So I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, of course, this, um, this study will not be possible with uh, a great number of people. Um, my supervisors, the Stramapodo Pool and Theo Marinis, as well as the MA student, Rania Dara, who are also involved in this uh, study. And we all thank the children who participate in the study, their parents, the school units with uh, which we cooperated. Uh, and we also thank um, the interpreters without whom we wouldn't be able to translate and transcribe um, the, 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 the responses in the L1 of the children. Uh, there's assistants Nina Duca and Hodula Gujuli and all the student assistants. So thank you again, and I'm looking forward to um, your feedback and your questions.